My name is Catherine Algor, and I'm the president here at the Society, and I want to welcome you all. Now, for you regulars, you may note that I'm dressed a little bit more casually than I usually am, but today we are going on an outing. We're going on a field trip, and we're lucky enough to have a very special uh, behind-the-scenes tour of the Forbes House Museum. For those of you who are new to our public programs, uh, a special welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society, and we hope we see you again and again. And we'd love you to get to know us a little bit. So I would recommend that you go on to our website, which is masshist.org, and just take a look about who we are and what we have to offer. Um, I always like to recommend that people start with the blog because it's always some sort of short, well-written, punchy story about an event or a collection or a set of characters uh, in, a, in, in Massachusetts and in Boston. And the other uh, fun sort of feature is called Object of the Month, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's some object from the collection that one of our um, talented researchers has taken out and examined. And it might be something that's incredibly historically significant, very beautiful, or maybe just downright weird. Um, there's also a little button at the top that says About. And if you click on that, you can hear about our history. We are the first uh, historical society in America we have a huge collection of 14 million items, um, but there's also another little section of that about part that says mission, vision, and values. And I would love to share that with you as well. And there's a lot there to say, but I just wanna reinforce one of our values, which is our commitment to access. We make not only these public programs free and available to everybody, but almost everything we do from exhibition attendance to helping uh, children with history day to training teachers, we do it for free. And we're able to do it because we have such a wonderful group of supporters who make all that we do possible. And yes, I would like you to be part of that community as well. So where you have the other little buttons, there's one that says support. And if you click on that, you can find ways to make a gift or better yet, become a member and be truly part of the family. But let's get on to today's program. So let me toss it to Gavin Cleespees, who's our Director of Public Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Engagement. Gavin. Thank you, Catherine, for that uh, greeting. Uh, and welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Um, this is a, a fun program. We've started uh, a series of tours of uh, historical societies in the greater Boston area or throughout, throughout Massachusetts. Um, this is a, an effort on our part to uh, introduce our audience and audiences throughout the Commonwealth uh, to really great sites that maybe uh, they have not yet visited and are a little bit outside of the, the traditional tourist areas. Um, today we have a great opportunity to have a tour of the Forbes House Museum um, and it's going to be, I think, a, a great event. Uh, today we are joined uh, by two speakers who are going to give us a tour of the Forbes House Museum. Uh, Heidi Vaughn is the Executive Director of the Forbes House Museum in Milton, Mass. Uh, she has a background in museum education and nonprofit development work um, and has been an active parent in town. Uh, she has worked to transform the Forbes House Museum from a traditional house museum into a vibrant multifaceted community resource. Under her leadership, the museum has developed new partnerships with Courageous Conversations Toward Racial Justice, uh, the Boston Dragon Boat Festival, Art Week Milton, and others. Uh, she earned her BA in Art History from Williams College. She is joined by Susan LaChevry, who is the curator of the Commonwealth's Art Collection at the Massachusetts State House uh, and is a trustee of the Forbes House Museum, where she has served as the chair of the Collections Committee for the last seven years. Uh, she is a graduate of uh, Wellesley College and Boston University. It's great to see you today and uh, take it away. I thought I'd start with um, the people behind the scenes. This is myself and my assistant, Gwen. Um, we are the two full-time staff members at the Forbes House Museum, and thankfully we have Susan helping us and 14 other trustees, um, as well as a bunch of volunteers. We couldn't do what we do without all of their help. Um, so, let's get into it. Um, let's see. Welcome to the Forbes House Museum. We are a Greek revival style museum located on the top of Adams Street in Milton, Massachusetts with a commanding view 
across Governor Hutchinson's field. The Neponset River is visible in the background along with the Boston city skyline. And this, the story that we tell when people come to the house is of the four generations of Forbes family members who lived here and who originally made their money in the China trade of the 1800s. Um, the museum itself is a Greek re revival style. You can see my office there in the top right hand corner um, and the cupola on the very top. And you can imagine Mrs. Forbes in the 1800s looking out to the harbor, watching for the ships that would be leaving or coming back from China because that was a really long voyage. It could take years. Um, and you never knew if your loved ones were going to return. So here are some of the, oh, I think I skipped a slide. Here we go. This is how the house looked when it was originally built on the left-hand side, a little simpler. There's less exterior ornamentation, but you might also notice another significant difference. I'll let you look at it for just a minute. So in the 1870s, the family that um, moved into the house at the time was going to be living there full time and raising children. Whereas before then, the family had really just used it as a seasonal retreat, a weekend home. So when they started living there full time, they added that third story that you can see there. And that was where the servants slept. Um, the second level is where the family had their bedrooms and the main level were the living quarters. In the basement, we have a servant's kitchen and dining room. So meet some of the Forbes family. Margaret Perkins Forbes was the first one to live in this house with her daughters. The house was built for her by Robert Bennett Forbes with money that he had earned from the China trade and his brother, John Murray Forbes. Now I love to look at the two brothers portraits next to one another like this because it really reveals a lot about the men that they were. Um, if I were to ask you, you know, who was the daring captain? Um, the gregarious one who loved adventure and who was the behind the scenes investor, you'd probably say John Murray Forbes must have been the savvy investor who kept his nose turned into his ledger books. Um, and Robert Bennett Forbes must be the captain. He looks jauntily out at us, um, confidently meeting our gaze. He sits there with his arm resting over the back of his chair, whereas, um, John Murray prefers to be counting, perhaps, counting his, in, his investments. He actually was able to save his older brother from near bankruptcy on at least one occasion. Um, and it's interesting when you compare their heads, <laughs> John Murray is bald. That was a real asset for him. People thought he was older than he was. It lent him a certain gravitas and they were more willing to do business with him. Um, Ben, on the other hand, was sometimes called Black Ben because he had this shock of curly black hair on the top of his head. So this is the side entrance of the museum. And I mentioned the brothers built this house for their mother. Where was the father? He had actually died and he hadn't left the family very well off at all. Um, so Mrs. Forbes was a widow and she had also lost her first son in a typhoon off the coast of Canton. That was the ship that he went down on, the Haiti. Thomas Tunno was 29 years old when he drowned. And um, so those two younger brothers really had to step up and take care of the family. They were able to build this house for their mother, but also as a memorial to their dead brother. And I think that's why there's that heart that greets you just over the entrance to the side of the house there. So while we're closed, yes, we're still closed, um, we've been able to utilize a lot of the property. And I hope that you might find an opportunity to come visit us because there's a lot to enjoy, not just Governor Hutchinson's field across the street in the view, but one of the things that was just added in the past few weeks, you see there on the left, that is a native perennial pollinator garden. And it was a project by a local Boy Scout with the input of a lot of different community groups, but all of those plants have their common names and their Latin names. So there's, um, there's the educational side of the pollinator garden as well as the environmental
benefit. So it's a great asset to our property. And I can't wait to see as these um, plants continue to grow and thrive in our backyard. We also introduced a story walk. It's actually our third summer doing it. And this summer we focused on a story called our animal kingdom. So I mentioned four generations of Forbes family members lived here. The last person to live at the Forbes mansion was Mary Bowditch Forbes. And so we have excerpts of an autobiography of sorts that she wrote. And she was really a very humorous, observant um, young lady when she wrote this. They're very um, humorous tales about her and her pet menagerie. And you get a glimpse into what life was like as um, growing up in a Boston Brahmin family. So as you go from one numbered sign to the next, you'll be led through the story and around the property so you can really take it all in. This is a building in the back of the property. So the property is on about six acres of land. On the right, you see the carriage house, the original carriage house, and you can see that it's done in the style like the main mansion. Um, when the family was living there in the 1880s, thereabouts, they had a stable, they had a need for a stable for their horses, so they built the barn and they enlisted the help of renowned Boston architects Peabody and Stearns, who added that shingle style addition that extends off to the left. This is an underutilized part of the museum at the moment. Um, at one time there was a caretaker or a, a driver who lived there. There was a small apartment on the second floor, but currently the barn has no running water or heat. It has electricity, but there's some issues with um, the windows and the roof. So we're gonna have to put some money into repairs. It's a really, special space. It's a really impressive, um, it's really impressive architecturally, and we're hoping to be able to um, make it more accessible, make it more comfortable, and use it a lot more for events and also space rentals. So that's going to be one of our fundraising initiatives in the coming years. Meet Henry Ashton Crosby Forbes. He is the nephew of Mary Bowditch Forbes, and he founded this museum in 1964 as the Museum of the American China Trade. Um, you can see in his words what the museum was, its original intent. The museum's goal was not only to preserve the history and memorabilia of America's great sagas, but also to inform the relevance of our early contacts with Asia. We haven't completely gone away from our roots. That's still part of what we do. Um, but in the past year, we have created a new mission. Inspired by the Forbes family legacy of entrepreneurship, social action, and philanthropy, Forbes House Museum fosters discourse around civic engagement and cultural awareness. This is a really important part of who we are now. We're really focused outwardly. How can we engage the community? Um, we want to be relevant in the important conversations that are happening today and to connect current events back to the very important history that's preserved in the Forbes House Museum. Finally, I'm welcome you, welcoming you inside the museum. Those are the front doors that you would come in and you have our food dogs greeting you on either side. The food dogs are always in pairs, the yin and yang, male and female. And if you look closely at the food dogs, um, the one on the left has its paw resting on a baby foo, and the one on the right has its paw resting on a ball, which could represent the earth. That is the male, the protector of the earth, his companion is the protector of the children of the earth. And they're often placed at the entrances to temples or homes because they ward off evil from without. Um, the close-up of the food dog at the bottom, you can see the ferocity in their, um, in their expression. The bulging eyes, the bared mouth with those fangs, and then look at their tails. They're like these flames of fire springing from the, um, 
from their backs. So um, we have three sets of food dogs. These are probably the fiercest and so accordingly placed right at the front. Entering the museum, if you take a left, you would enter the Chinese parlor. And this, is, this room has such a nice feel to it with the warm glow that you see from those lanterns. Those are reverse glass and then hand-painted silk wallpaper. And it's just, it's kind of cozy. Um, but also on kind of cloudy days like this, it can be hard to really appreciate all the artifacts around the room. Um, when you see a portrait, more often than not, that's an important part of the story. And above the fireplace, you can see a portrait of the gentleman, Hukwa. Hukwa was one of 13 Hong merchants appointed by the Emperor of China to do business with the Westerners. This was so that the Chinese people wouldn't be um, poisoned by the influence of the, the foreign devils or the, the foreign mud. He wanted to limit uh, the interactions that his Chinese people had with Westerners. So each merchant was assigned to do business with a different country. Hukwa was assigned to do business with America. And lucky for us, he was probably the richest man in the world. He died in the mid 1800s with $26 million. Um, but he was kind and generous to his business partners, particularly he had a good relationship with the Forbes brothers. He almost adopted them like his godsons, um, John Murray Forbes in particular. So while many um, homes that trace their lineage back to Chinese merchants or museums might have a portrait of Hukwa, he would give this to his business associates as they left the country. Not everyone has what we have at the Forbes house. So as you're looking at that picture and you see his hat resting on the table next to him, there's a coral ball that sits on the top. That was representative of his position in society just below nobility. When he died, his descendants gave that finial to the Forbes family to really represent that close bond that they had. And it rests on our mantelpiece just underneath his, um, his portrait. He gave a half a million dollars to John Murray Forbes to invest in the development of the Con Transcontinental Railway, which John Murray Forbes was overseeing. So some might refer to him as the Chinese godfather of our railway system. On the right, that gives you a sense of what life was like in Canton. The um, factories is what those buildings were called, and that's where a lot of the trade took place. And I believe there were sleeping rooms on the upper floors. And each one was um, housed one company's businesses. And you can see the American flag flying there. This was about a mile stretch of land outside the wall of Canton that um, that's where Westerners were more or less limited. On occasion, people like the Forbes brothers were invited to um, Hukwa's estate. It was a grand estate with flowing waterways and wandering peacocks where he would serve days long worth almost uh, feasts to um, people who came to visit. But um, for the most part, people were restricted to this, this small area. This is um, close-ups of some really amazing artifacts that we have in the Chinese parlor. So the two on the left are different images of the Buddhist goddess Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy. Um, the one on the left was probably dates to the Ming dynasty carved from ivory, um, about 10 inches tall. The one in the middle is about three feet tall, carved from marble. And it makes all the sense in the world that Kuan Yin be in with the Forbes family. Um, as they were sailors going back and forth to China, she was the patron of seamen and would watch over them. Um, and then the vase on the right is just my personal, one of my personal favorites of the collection. Uh, somebody on a tour once asked, what would you save if there were a zombie apocalypse? Um, now Susan might not agree with me because it might not be the most historically significant or valuable piece, but to me, I just love the contrast of textures and colors and the detail of that handle 
that serpentine snake. Um, and I just think it's, it's a beautiful piece. So I wanted to share that. Moving on from the Chinese parlor, this is the living room right next to it. And so now you start to see how the family really lived during the Victorian era and how they, they started to decorate this house. Um, there's a lot you know, to talk about here. I wanna point out two things in particular. One is that ship that you see in the back left corner. Um, that was built by Robert Bennett Forbes for the students at the Perkins School for the Blind. If you remember when I introduced you earlier to Margaret Perkins Forbes, um, the Perkins family, she was the sister of Thomas Handyside Perkins, who was um, philanthropic in numerous ways in the Boston area. The Perkins School for the Blind was just one of the organizations that he helped to fund. Um, and it's uh, one example of the humanitarian um, endeavors that um, later generations took on as well. On the right is a burled walnut bookcase filled with books that the Forbes family actually read, some that they wrote. And one, um, one summer, we were doing a project with an intern cataloging all the books in the library. And at the bottom of the bookcase, you'll see some drawers, which while I had been at the museum had never been opened. So we opened it up and lo and behold, we found a Bible. It was a Bible that belonged to Robert Bennett Forbes. It was a Bible that we had been searching for for months because slightly before that, um, the author Stephen Paleo was working on a book about the captain, the captain's voyage of mercy to Ireland during the Great Famine. So his book, Voyage of Mercy, was released in March. And he was writing about the captain and he knew from the captain's letters that he he noted down in this Bible important family events, including the birth and the death at the age of only one of his daughter, Rose. And he wanted to find the Bible. And Gwen and I were looking high and low and Susan was looking and we couldn't, couldn't find this Bible. Um, but then shortly before the book actually went to print, we came upon this Bible. So I raced up to my desk and emailed Stephen. And um, instead of writing in the book, the Bible has been lost to history he was able to actually include it because we had finally found it. Um, so with that, I would like to turn this over to Susan and I will be on hand, Susan, to advance your slides as you go on. All right. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, Heidi's walked you through a few of the period rooms on the first floor. Uh, the other three floors of the mansion are accessed by this a wonderful spiral staircase that you would see as you walk through those uh, uh, entry doors earlier. Um, most of the houses of this era, of course, had straight staircases, but Rogers designed uh, this one, perhaps in consultation with the captain um, that is reminiscent of those found in lighthouses. Uh, it's just another one of the uh, wonderful nautical design elements that was incorporated uh, into this mansion when it was originally built. Uh, next, please. The second floor uh, contains the private living quarters, as Heidi mentioned, with four interconnecting rooms uh, flanking a central hall, just as they do on the first floor. Uh, the window that you see uh, is directly over the front door, so that would uh, uh, give you a small orientation. Uh, we don't know exactly what the small room at the end of this hallway was used for, perhaps a nursery or a sitting room. Uh, next, Heidi. But um, we have installed it as a uh, the captain's study. This is a rather moody photograph of his own desk and personal items. Um, the captain's uh, interests extended beyond China, beyond the China trade. Um, open on his desk. Oh, there's my phone. <laughs> open on his desk um, is a book on yacht design, uh, and. As you may know, the captain, Robert Ben Forbes, was involved in the design, construction, or had interest in over 60 ships and small pleasure craft during his life, and was always seeking improvements in safety and integrity and speed. Um, there were sidelines, of course, um, for example, at the beginning of the Civil War. 
the Forbes family supported the Northern cause whenever possible. And, but the captain felt, however, that his only expertise was in ships. Um, but he petitioned Governor Andrew in 1861 for permission to raise a corps of seagoing men for drill and discipline to be called a Coast Guard. Um, and the idea was to establish a school of instruction for the purposes of um, exercise in marine gunnery and uh, tactics and so on. Um, and he said, on the eve of a long war, many merchant captains, mates, and seamen would be wanted to man the Navy, and he understood that they would need training. Uh, he also offered his services to help design and commission gunboats and warships for the Navy. Uh, it may be because he actually had firsthand experience with a U.S. Navy vessel. Next, buddy. Uh, in 1847, um, as more reports uh, of the desperate conditions in Ireland were reaching the states, primarily through the newspapers, um, increasingly these reports were illustrated, uh, John Mahoney being one of the primary suppliers of this documentation. Uh, and with a, a, a picture being worth so many words, this really hit home in Boston and the Forbes brothers joined a contingent of prominent political leaders and clergy and concerned citizens to send relief to Cork. Next. Uh, so in an unprecedented vote by Congress, the USS Jamestown, which was a sloop of war, uh, dock, dry dock in Charlestown was loaned to the newly formed New England Relief Committee, uh, which was private, uh, on the strength of the captain's uh, offer to command her. Here's a painting in our collection of the Jamestown leaving Boston Harbor um, under curiously sunny skies as they actually set sail in an ice storm. Uh, but we can forgive the painter, uh, George Atkinson, for this um, as he made this painting from a print um, that Forbes commissioned for his final report. So um, ergo the misunderstood weather conditions. Um, but uh, about 30 minutes out of Boston Harbor, uh, Forbes was already complaining about the aspects of the ship's construction and so on. So he realized that the US Navy could use some help. Next. The famine relief voyage brought 800 tons of donated food and clothing to Cork, for which the Forbes and the New England Relief Committee uh, were recognized with a number of testimonials, many of which we have in our collection, including this uh, splendid gilded harp with the thanks of the people framed within, and also this uh, engraved silver salver. Next. Um, one of the bedrooms uh, on the the second floor has been turned into an exhibition room. Uh, the others are installed. Uh, and this is a view of our last exhibition, which is called Man Overboard. Um, the, where we examined uh, in this exhibit um, the additional interests in, and activities that I would broadly categorize as safety. Um, in his autobiography, Forbes writes time and again of the unforgiving nature of sea travel. So we looked at his early experiences, his formative years, his involvement in the design and building of ships and with an eye to meeting these challenges and uh, the other charitable activities, uh, namely his seemingly nonstop advocacy for improvements in ship safety, but also the safety of crew and passengers and cargo. Uh, Forbes's first experience at sea was when he accompanied his mother to Europe as a child uh, on a voyage that I call all that could go wrong on a ship. Uh, a four-day hurricane, a severely battered ship, seasickness, capture, and detention in Marseille, a full-on battle at sea with the British, inexperienced crews, escaped in Portugal in a fishing boat. It goes on and on and on. He was eight years old uh, during all of this. Uh, next, Heidi. Uh, so uh, undeterred by these earlier experiences, he went to China at the age of 13 as a cabin boy in one of his uncle's vessels uh, and aboard there. Um, Forbes was the inexperienced crew member. Uh, he became 
however, an ardent student of the mechanics of sailing. We have his childhood copy of uh, Bowditch's Practical Navigator, one of the few things he stored in his small trunk. Uh, again, um, the fickleness of the both sea and sailors. Uh, he witnessed insubordination, disease, burial at sea, um, all of which would uh, prepare him for a life of command. Um, and he, but he also witnessed the loss of another young man while he was tending to a sail and the failed attempts to rescue him. And he writes that this had a profound effect on him. It was something that he remembered all his life. And that feeling was only exacerbated, of course, um, and the danger just cemented uh, forever when his older brother Thomas was lost during that uh, storm off the China coast. Next. Uh, throughout his life, uh, Forbes kept meticulous records and studied the performance of practically every ship on every voyage on the open sea. He was preoccupied with navigation routes and speed, not only for economic reasons, but also to outrun storms and pirates. And he applied these observations and um, to design and modifications in many ships that uh, that he was associated with. Um, he designed a new balancing system, for uh, for example, in the in the hull of uh, of ships, and a different type of rigging for managing the topsails when he observed crew was having difficulty. Um, and he eventually patented uh, what is called the Forbes rig. He built the first metal hulled ships in New England and studied the advantages of hybrid ships that could run under steam and as well as under sail uh, and kept records of their performance, of course. Next. Uh, Forbes not only commanded ships, but also sailed as a passenger, of course. Uh, here is a certificate that was presented to him for saving several people from drowning during a shipwreck. Uh, next, Heidi. Forbes initiated or cooperated with others to advance improvements across the marine industry. Uh, he spoke and wrote extensively in his later years on measures that should be adopted or strengthened to ensure safety at sea. We have um, all of these treatises in the, in the um, uh, house. Uh, this is just a short list of some of his concerns. Um, his experience on the Europa, uh, for which, which we just saw the certificate, likely reinforced his promotion, for example, of a European-style life vest that was made from a mattress, mattresses filled with cork with a hole in the foot that you would fit over your head, uh, poncho-style. Uh, the cork would not only keep you afloat, but would protect you uh, should you land on the rocks. Next, please. Um, thousands of nautical miles also led to a deep appreciation of the toll taken on the crew. Uh, and uh, I um, think this quote um, sums up very nicely how, he, how much he felt about this. Um, we have been too much accustomed to consider the seaman as a mere machine, a mass of bone and muscle to bear all the quote, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune without a murmur and for the smallest pittance. The seaman may be said to have no political existence. He cannot vote because of his absence. His wages are smaller, considering the amount of labor and the responsibility devolving on him than are the wages of any other class of our working population. He must be up day and night incessantly when duty calls and when the Sabbath, that great boon of landsmen comes, his rest depends on the faithless winds of heaven. He has no day, no night which he can call his own, and when he begins to feel the effect of age, he often has no home to which to return. That was um, from a, a lecture that he delivered at the Boston Marine Society in 1854. Forbes was a founding member of Snug Harbor that provided aid to these retired sailors and uh, he helped lead the Marine Society, the Pilots' Relief, and, and several other uh, local relief committees. Next. Um, 
finally, this is, this is Sylph, one of Forbes's yachts that had the accidental honor of being in what has been called the first unofficial yacht race in America in 1834 or so. Um, there is a marvelous story associated with this that unfortunately I don't have time for, but lest I leave you with the impression that the captain was all work and no play, um, there is a sweet story of the time that Forbes challenged his cousin and his friends to a race in their small yachts to Marblehead and back. And after lunch, when they set back to Boston, uh, Forbes distracted his cousin by tossing champagne bottles into the water and watched him deviate off course to rescue them, um, which caused him to lose much time and consequently the race. So uh, the captain would say, focus is everything. Uh, so speaking of champagne, I will turn this back to Heidi for some programming. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. So we wanted to share with you a little bit of um, the fun events that we look forward to having uh, again once we're able to gather in groups. On the left, you see a group of fifth graders. We're part of the History of Milton tour. Um, and then in the top middle, those are actually a group of students from the Milton High School. They were performing for a holiday program. We do something called Mary Historic Milton, where we team up with the Eustace Estate, which is a historic New England property, and the Wakefield Estate in Arboretum, which is another historic property in town. And it's a progressive dinner um, that takes the... Um, that takes visitors from one house to the next and all the houses are decorated for the holidays and there's entertainment and light bites. Um, on the bottom there is how we've been able to use the barn without really bringing big groups inside. We use it as a backdrop for what we call barn fest. We have local musicians performing. We bring in a brewery and a food truck and it's just a nice family friendly event. Uh, the right is Gwen. She is really creative in taking some of the Forbes stories and she's turned some of them into ghost stories. So that's Gwen um, on one Halloween event. I had talked a little bit about Mary Bowditch Forbes. Here's a pencil drawing of Mary. Um, what she did over the course of her lifetime for almost 50 years was collect Lincoln and Civil War memorabilia. She never married, she never had a family. This was her passion. And she uh, would invite the public in. It was important to her to, that people kept the legacy of Lincoln alive, um, the ideals of good citizenship that he espoused. So she had this log cabin replica built in the backyard and she would fill it with um, some of her collection and open the cabin up to the public. We still um, do that today at least once a year. Here it's pictured with a group of Boy Scouts who have helped us for about three years, three different park days, helping to clean up the property and plant bulbs. Um, and here's just a fun image taking you back to 1927 when Mary would open up that Lincoln cabin and thousands of people would descend upon the property. Um, there were often parades coming up Adams Street and then people would wait hours for the opportunity to step inside that cabin where some of them said they felt the spirit of Lincoln. Uh, today, we continue that tradition. It's not quite as well attended, um, but one of the things Mary did was she started an essay and drawing contest for students in kindergarten through grade eight. So that is part of our Lincoln Day celebration. We invite reenactors. There you see um, some of the women from the US Sanitary Commission playing with the kids. So it, that is another fun family event. And then on the right, we held um, with Courageous Conversations Toward Racial Justice, a Reading Frederick Douglass Together event. This is a program sponsored by Mass Humanities. Uh, you might be familiar with it. It happens in other locations throughout the Boston area. And what it is, is um, community members are invited to come in and take turns reading portions of Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Um, it's usually done the week right before or right after the Fourth of July. And this is a nice link to Mary's collection and a nice way for us to live out our mission, being a space where people can come together um, and talk about 
important current events, especially now with social justice and anti-racism at the forefront of a lot of our community conversations, um, events like this are even more important and we hope to do more of them. So as I'm nearing the end of this, I invite you to follow us on Instagram. We have taken our, our mascot here, Foo, and we have something called Foo Dog Friday. So each Friday I post um, Foo with a different um, item from the collection or something to promote an upcoming event. And it's kind of just a fun way to, to bring people in and, and make, um, make the museum welcoming and inviting and um, playful. Now, I feel bad about this. I think we might possibly be competing with um, one of your programs, Gavin. Um, but this coming Thursday on July 23rd, we're having Stephen Ujifusa do a Zoom. He wrote the book, Barons of the Sea and the Race to Build the World's Fastest Clipper Ship. Um, so this talks about Forbes and it talks about some other major players, Delano's and Lowe's. Um, these men that were making fortunes for themselves, kind of setting up their family dynasties, competing with one another for, um, to be the first to bring their goods to market. Um, it covers the China trade and also um, the gold rush, the dangerous trips to California, but it's, it's exciting if you're into sailing. It's a lot of technical, um, technical information about the construction of the ships, but you also get to, to meet these really colorful characters and uh, see how they contributed in a major way to the economic development of America in the 19th century. So um, that is our presentation. And I guess we're ready, um, ready for questions. Uh, Lisa asked, uh, thanks for this chance to visit virtually. Do you know if Robert Bennett Forbes brought any Chinese servants back from Canton when he returned from his second trip in the early 1840s? I don't believe he did. We don't have any record of, um, of that. Most of their servants were actually Irish. And in fact, that you know, after so many Irish were fleeing the uh, famine, a lot of them came to the Boston area and found work as domestic servants. I'd say most of the servants the Forbes employed were Irish. I think there might have been one Swedish, and that that was basically the composition. Uh, there was a anonymous attendee who um, asked a question about the opium trade. Um, and uh, was questioning if there are any evidence in the Forbes family papers that any of them objected uh, to the opium trade or found it unethical? That is such a great question. Um, and it's something that we are exploring in depth currently as we're working on an exhibit on the history and continuing consequences of the opium trade. Um, I believe Captain Forbes was conflicted I think when he first got into the opium trade, um, you know, the British East India Company had had a monopoly on opium for a long time. Um, so the Indian opium, the better quality opium was off limits to the Americans. They sourced their opium from Turkey and were still able to find uh, quite a market for it. And it was kind of one of those things everyone did. And it wasn't outlawed in the United States or the America at the time. Um, in fact, it was used medicinally in laudanum, um, sometimes given to women suffering from hysteria. They kind of compared it to, to alcohol, um, no worse than alcohol. Um, but then as things progressed, as um, the Chinese government stepped up um, the enforcement against the smuggling of opium, and uh, I they definitely had second thoughts and um you know even when ben was writing back to his wife i think it was a relief for him to finally get out of it but there's a lot wrapped up into that story um great question we're still diving into it and i hope when we do have this exhibit um that you know you'll come see what we've discovered and we can continue this conversation 
Um, so one question was, uh, if you stand at the front door and look out sort of to the scenery, uh, how different is what you see from what Robert Bennett Forbes would have seen? Um, it's actually, apart from the size of the trees um, <laughs> that have grown up around the, the, the um, fields and on the property, it's, it, it isn't much different, to be honest. Um, there, there is a, um, a fairly unobstructed view across the Neponset, um, uh watershed uh, out to sea. Uh, you do see some buildings, of course, uh, closer to Boston and Dorchester that you might not see otherwise um, earlier. But uh, uh, when you, as Heidi mentioned earlier, um, if you if you go up into the upper levels of the house, uh, you can see you can see right out to the harbor. It's magnificent as on a clear day. Um, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be much different. Well, we also had a, a question specifically for Susan, which was, Susan, if there was a zombie apocalypse, what objects would you do? Mine. I was waiting for that. <laughs> it's, oh, and um, I'll have to give the cop-out answer that a curator has no, no favorites. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I, I get this answer a lot at, at the State House, too, uh, or give this question. Um, I would pick one from each category of collections, I think, is what I would do. I would take something significant from the China, um, probably that portrait of Hukua, which would represent our China story uh, and his very special relationship with, with the um, Forbes brothers and so on. And I would, I would work my way up from there. Um, it's, I, I, it is a question I can, I can never answer wherever I have ever worked. <laughs> I'm very sorry for that. Um, well, Liz asked, uh, what was the state of the house like when it was taken over by the Forbes House Museum or the China Trade Museum at the time? So was the house in good shape or was it in bad shape? Um, we, we actually don't have a lot of photographic documentation of the house when Mary died and Crosby inherited it. Uh, we we know that he um, he had uh, some storage facilities and so on uh, elsewhere um, nearby the property and so on. He also started to acquire some supplementary China trade material um, to tell the China trade story and turn and and develop the, the American China Trade Museum. Um, but uh, we he did a large part of that in the buildings outside and other properties that, that we owned and so on. So the, um, the inside of the museum, we understand there was an effort to keep it um, as, as it, with these period artifacts and you know, the, the wallpaper wasn't changed and, and all of that. But we don't have any, we don't have any early photographic evidence. It's, it's a shame. Um, uh, so we, we, we can't be sure, but there was a lot of, there were a lot of personal effects as well as collections that he identified as being Forbes, Forbes uh, family artifacts um, that he made a point of keeping in the house when he spun the China Trade Museum off to the Peabody Essex. Uh, so my guess is that a lot of it had been preserved. Um, because we do have so much um, that we can document back to each of these family members. Um, so we had a question. Um, we always hear about the Forbes boys, their uncles, and their mother, but we hear little about their father, Ralph. Uh, what have you been able to learn about him? Did he live in the house or pass away before it was completed? I think we know the answer to that question, but, but what, do, what else do we know about the father? So Ralph died, oh gosh, when he was maybe in his late forties. I think he suffered from gout. Um, he also just didn't seem to have much of a head for business and um, just wasn't able to really leave much behind for his family. Um, I think one of our tour guides kind of refers to him as a ne'er-do-well. I don't know if that's a hundred percent accurate. Um, did you want to add something to that, Susan? Uh, no, he 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 was in in business um, and and so on. But we we know that yeah he 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 was struggling. We we understand that. And um, 
uh, when he died, um, that uh, contributed to the family's uh, dependence on the Perkinses, on Margaret's family, um, mm -hmm. to for their for their support and their help. And so Uncle Thomas and his brother James um, took the boys in and um, into the um, uh, Perkins and Company uh, shipping business to help support them. So uh, another person asked, how many floors of the house are open to the public? Or how much of the house? Sure, so there's the basement, which is basically the servants area. We have an education room down there. There's the main floor and the second floor. I would love to be able to take people up to the cupola on maybe special behind the scenes tours, but the access is via a very steep staircase with very narrow stairs. So I don't think that's in the cards anytime soon. Oh, and the Lincoln cabin. You do get to see inside the Lincoln cabin if you like. Um, a, another person asked, uh, international shipping was much more precarious in the 19th or the 18th and 19th century. Uh, did the family ever experience any hardships? Uh, this is presumably other than the son who died uh, from broken trade agreements or ships which were lost at sea or subject to pirates. Pirates probably being the most exciting part <laughs> <laughs> that comes up. I don't think I have any pirate stories. Um, I know uh, Robert Bennett Forbes lost most of his money in the Panic of 1837, which prompted him going back to China. Um, he spent a lot of time on Linton Island, specifically loading and unloading chests of opium. Um, but actually, it's amazing to me that all the trips they made, there aren't more stories of um, storms and, and life-threatening adventures. I don't know. Susan, do you there, have other stories? There, there are stories of storms, but I think the skill of the, um, at least those in command of these ships, um, it was extraordinary. Um, and they, they did not suffer um, a often loss of cargo or, or ship damage or uh, probably damage, but not loss of ships, loss of extraordinary loss of life. Um, he does tell a story of one of his trips to South America when they, they literally reap a, a, a mass snapped in two. They were too far out to sea and they repaired it um, during the storm, during the night. Um, and I, I thought that was always sort of stayed with me because it sort of testified to the, the skill of the people that were working on these ships, despite his complaints of how unskilled that they were. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I, I imagine they, he does mention pirates, escaping pirates, running from pirates. I'm not quite sure that they were actually overtaken or threatened, but he does mention that speed was a, um, a, a, a big factor in um, the, the, the seaworthiness of these ships because mm -hmm. they needed to, when they needed the speed and they needed the seaworthiness, it, 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 they needed it for a reason. So, um, um, so maybe we have time for one or, or two more questions. Um, one person wrote, um, can you give a broader context of the importance of the China trade in building uh, the economy in Boston and Massachusetts? So the uh, China trade, when we got into it, it was really exciting. Again, um, for a long time, we hadn't been able to have our own shipping companies when we were a British colony. So suddenly when the seas and global trading were open to us, it was hugely exciting. Um, we were taking, in the beginning, um, ginseng, sandalwood, and furs to China. We were bringing back primarily tea. That was the biggest deal. Nobody else knew how to cultivate tea. Um, silks and porcelain. And um, it, it, was a, it was a huge business. And lots of family fortunes, you know, I've referenced the Delano's, the Lowe's, the Forbes's, were made on this, um, on this China trade. And then um, people started looking westward during the gold rush, kind of in the mid 1800s, the China trade wasn't quite where everybody's focus was, but with money, like I mentioned, um, John Murray Forbes started knitting together this railway system, you know, that, that was expanding westward, and, and he was really instrumental in completing the first transcontinental rail line. Um, and then they had investments in other um, 
other resources, some mining industries, some things like that. Um, can you add anything to that, Susan? Telephones. <laughs> the telephone industry. Um, no, I mean, if you, if you think of the, the uh, Salem also, of course, um, benefited extraordinarily from their, their trade, their shipping, um, uh, and their, their, um, the families that, that worked, that sailed out of Salem to the, to the east. Um, so uh, I, I think that the, um, the popularity of the things that were being brought back changed over time. Um, after a while, there, there was a glut of porcelain, actually, that was coming back. Um, but uh, so they just adapted. They brought back what people wanted um, rather than what they, um, or what they, they brought back what they thought would sell. Um, and the same with the textiles and, of course, and tea never goes out of style. <laughs> Great. So uh, we also had a question. Uh, who are the Forbes major competitors in the China trade? So Sturgis and Company um, was probably one. The uh, the Forbeses. So they were working for their uncle's firm, Perkins and Company, which then merged with Russell and Company. Russell and Company was the largest, most successful American trading firm at the time, um, and of course the British East India Company. Um, they were the biggest players, I'd say, in the trade at the time. Um, so I would uh, encourage everyone. Uh, to visit if they have an opportunity. Um, and here is the Forbes House website. Um, so if you would like to learn more about it, please uh, visit their website while we are uh, socially distancing ourselves. Um, but once the museum opens, I think everyone would really enjoy it. Um, it's a great place to visit. It's also right uh, down the street from the Eustace Estate, which is also another uh, wonderful place to visit. And it's very close to the to the Blue Hills. So uh, you could make a whole day out of it and go and visit Milton. Um, as always, um, the Massachusetts Historical Society is happy to host these programs for free uh, while the economy is in a bit of a tailspin. Um, but if people are able to support either the Forbes House or the Massachusetts Historical Society, I would encourage people to consider joining. So thank you all for uh, joining us and uh, thank you Heidi and Susan for the, for the tour. Thank you very much.